<laughs> so um, I'm going to uh, give a bit of an overview talk here and uh, see how much I can squeeze into the time allotted. I just want to give an introduction to start with. Um, the Free Libre open source community has uh, often been thought of mainly in the context of software development. Um, but uh, actually we've really started to uh, move now into, into uh, not just open content but also tools that people can use even for proprietary content. Um, people used to use very expensive tools to develop their music and their videos and their what have you. And uh, particularly as you moved into the more time-consuming things like 3D animation and so on, so and so forth. And um, in fact, we've enabled an awful lot of uh, of work to be done now by uh, amateurs and hobbyists and people working at home and people putting things on YouTube and, and a real, you know, flourishing of creative content. So I think it's valuable to 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 value uh, what we've enabled as well as uh, the more obvious aspects of the the open community itself. So I'll be talking a bit about about all of that. Um, of course, uh, formats are important. Um, the uh, open formats are generally preferable because um, that makes it easier to, to access uh, the content and easier to preserve the content. If you, uh, if you provide your content in a, in a patented proprietary format, there's always the danger that uh, as time goes on, it'll be harder and harder to access that if the, the software used to play that eventually ceases to be available. Um, so obviously we should prefer open formats, but it is necessary sometimes to use patented formats to get widespread distribution. Um, not just in terms of spreading things around on the net, but also if you expect things to be played by, you know, movie theatres or TV stations or, or whatever, um, you know, you need to use whatever formats they want you to use. So um, again, there are some compromises sometimes necessary for, for uh, maximum audience, but of course we should always aim to, to keep in mind um, the benefits of openness as well. Um, so that said, um, what I'm going to talk about now is um, the truly impressive uh, array of tools that the community has, has created that people can use. Um, so that includes, uh, how do I get this to move on? That's moved on in my view, but not on the slideshow view. I don't use Impress very often. Uh, no, it doesn't because... Oh, it did. What do you know? All right, so I'm going to start by talking about, um, about text because that's a, a, a place where we all started before we had computers that actually do and could do anything else. Um, and uh, you use text a lot, not just because one of the content formats is writing. People write stories, they write fiction, they write non-fiction, they write documents. But also even when you're working on other things like um, other forms of media, you often need planning notes and and uh, scripts and all sorts of things. So of course that starts with text editors and there are lots of um, system default text editors that people use every day that are pretty decent. You've got um, ones with every environment. You've got gedit for GNOME, leafpad for LXDE, kate and, K and kwrite for KDE, uh, mousepad for XFCE, notepad for Windows, it's a bit shit but you know people use it. Uh, text edit for Mac OS, um, there's lots. And there's a huge array of choice here because of course programmers typically use text editors if they're not using a fancy IDE. So you've got Emacs, you've got the Vi and Vim family, you've got Nedit, you've got Udit which is good for uh, multilingual work. There's a huge range of, of text editing tools out there and that's certainly a good place to start, particularly to avoid distractions. A lot of the time formatting is, an, is something you do afterwards. Um, you, and, uh, and so just bashing away and putting some text in at the beginning is a good place to start. And there's no shortage of tools to choose from there, and that's been the case for a long time. So it's not worth me spending a lot of time talking about that. Um, then the next thing after that is uh, word processes, um, which is a rather strange bit of terminology that uh, uh, I won't go on about at the moment. I've got some, some things to say about that in other contexts. But um, there's a lot of, uh, of good options there now as well. There's Abbey Word, there's KWord, there's LibreOffice and OpenOffice. Um, and there's also the cloud-based things now like Google Docs and, and a variety of others. Um, so those are really not just a text editor but also provide various formatting options. Um, and those are quite fancy. Um, but another thing that is perhaps less well known but I think at least equally useful, if not more so, is text formatting programs. Um, the most prominent one being Lick, which is a nice GUI on top of tech, um, and which produces really beautifully formatted documents. And the difference between that and a word processor is that it's not WYSIWYG. You don't see your formatting immediately on the screen. Um, you indicate 
what kind of formatting you want, and it produces beautiful formatting um, as a separate process, as an output process. Um, and um, there's also GNU Tech Mac, which is a similar kind of idea. And there's also older things like Groff. You know, so there are ancient tools that, that this has you know, been around for a long time as well as kind of text processing. And you can often get better results with those things than you can with word processors, particularly for long documents. Word processors are not very well suited for novels and things like that. And you know, writers struggle with that all the time and get frustrated because really those tools are really meant for office work. And often they, they have misfeatures and, 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 and don't behave all that well for long and beautiful documents. And particularly things like magazines where you want beautiful layout and stuff, they're not really good for that. And so again, we know we have no shortage of lovely tools for that. Um, Lick and Tech and stuff are probably best known in, in the academic community and, and, and especially for math and physics papers, but actually they're really good for anything of that nature. Um, you can perfectly well do lovely humanities papers with it. Um, so um, that's what your options are for, for writing stuff. Um, but I should also briefly mention presentations is another form of writing like this, yeah? L-Y-X. Um, pronounced lick, but L-Y-X. Uh, and it's capital L, little y, capital X, because it's based on tech, which is capital T, little e, capital X. And so they like to have that little playing with capitalization to show the lineage. And it's a lovely GUI on top of tech. So basically, it, um, it allows you to, um, to just use your GUI for, for document entry and design. And then in the background, it runs tech for you. So you don't have to know any tech. If you know tech, you can actually put tech straight into your document, but you don't have to know it. And it will actually um, just go away and run tech in the background and produce beautiful PDFs or, or whatever you need as output on, on the back end. Um, so I do recommend that. Um, and uh, yeah, presentations is another form of writing. Um, I'm using um, LibreOffice Impress at the moment. Um, and uh, then there's others like Beamer and Magic Point and Simple Slides and things of that ilk, which use HTML as the raw format for the, um, for the presentation. Um, so those are useful tools. Um, less critical for content creators, except if you have to get grant money or otherwise, you know, imp uh, or go to conferences or otherwise show people what you're talking about. Um, script writing, however, is worth mentioning. Uh, I, I mentioned it briefly earlier, but there's actually some lovely specialist software for, and when I say script writing, I don't mean the programming sense. I mean, if you're doing theatre or film scripts, um, there's a program called Keltec, which is actually a, a C-E-L-T capital X, um, which is actually a um, customised version of um, Mozilla, I think, um, that has had kind of bits of tech built into it. And so it actually is a conglomeration of a whole lot of other open source programs, which is, again, shows the, the real benefit of that, um, which has a lot of specialist, um, like there's even some database features, so you can actually enter in who are the, the cast and, and who are the, the various roles that are going to be played in your, in your thing, and then you can um, do some scheduling and some assignment and, and say, what are the scenes, and you have little note cards, and you can shuffle them around, and then you can actually write the actual script around that, and, and, uh, and it's, it's quite um, powerful and, and, and excellent uh, to have specialized tools for that sort of thing that provide you with a lot of features that go well above and beyond just let's put some text on the page. So, you know, having open source tools for these kinds of things is very impressive. And again, they produce beautiful output and, uh, and, uh, and I'm quite impressed with how, how far that's come. And then the last thing I'm going to talk about in text is um, doing translations into other languages. Again, I'm not talking programming, I'm talking human languages. Um, there's some older software that started off with um, what's called PO files. Um, which is mostly used for programming, and it's certainly relevant if you're developing games or something. Um, and so you've got things like G-Translator and K-Babel as um, GUI interfaces to that, as well as a lot of um, command line tools. And the idea behind that is generally that you have either um, some kind of list of IDs for every possible string of text, or you just have the initial text in one language, say English, and then you just match up the original English text, uh, English text with the corresponding text in each other language. Um, however, there are also more advanced translation tools um, called translation memories, and there are things like Omega T is probably the, um, uh, the most prominent. That's O, capital O, M E G A, capital T, because everyone likes to use mixed case in their product names. Um, and so those are for um, more uh, large in scope translation projects where you might be translating something that has nothing to do with the program. You might be translating websites or books or something. Um, so um, that is, again, a specialised field where you need to track a lot of people's... You'll have different translators for every language, maybe even whole teams of people. You need to track all their input. You can't assume one person is going to do the whole project, so you might have to hand off little pieces to people, and uh, there might have to be other people checking it. And So, yeah, those things can be more about project management than anything else. Um, so, again, we've got some awesome open source tools for doing that sort of thing. Um, and, in fact, it's notable that open source programs tend to the language support because we have these tools and people can just scratch their own itch and do their own version. Um, you know, I think 
it was um, uh, Icelandic. Um, uh, in Iceland, they were qu fairly quick to switch to OpenOffice and LibreOffice because there is no Icelandic Microsoft Word, and there never will be because there aren't enough speakers of the language for them to be worth bothering to translate into Icelandic. And so when Microsoft said, no, we're not going to do Icelandic, um, they went, well, let's find a product that we can translate ourselves. And this has, again, been a big leg up for us because a lot of the more obscure languages in the world, um, you can't expect the big vendors to be bothered. Uh, there's no money in it for them. And if you've got a tool that you can translate yourself, you can get your own community and just do your own translation. Problem solved. So that's been awesome. Um, so moving on now. If I hit space again, yay. I've got the hang of this now. Um, so that's enough about text. Let's move on to images. Now, the two prominent forms of images that we usually think about are raster images or bitmap images and vector images. And uh, raster images are photo-ish type things. Um, and uh, not necessarily, though. I mean, you could also be um, looking at things that you've, you've drawn by hand, but um, hand drawings are more likely to be vectors because they're generally collections of, of lines that you've then filled in. Um, so raster images are more usually things that you've captured from somewhere, photographs um, or stills or, or desktop captures, even anything like that. And um, GIMP was sort of the most prominent program there that everyone's heard of. Um, and uh, it's pretty good. There were some complaints about the user interface, but there's sort of very user interfaces for it now, as well as a lot of development they themselves have done. Um, there's like Photo GIMP or something like that and, and other variants for people who like different user interfaces. Um, and uh, then there's also Krita. There's CinePaint, which is a specialized one that has much higher bit depth for people who are working in films and need really high resolution on the, on the colors. Um, there's even Paint.net, which is um, an open source version of Microsoft Paint for people who are familiar with that program and, and want to carry on using something they're familiar with. So we're well served in, in terms of just editing images, but images uh, also you often need to do other things. You need to actually pull stuff off cameras and process it. So you need a raw image processing programs, and you've got things like UF Raw, Raw Therapy, Darkroom, um, and then there's also photo management. Again, asset management is quite useful if you're going to have a lot of photos, if you're doing a big project, whether that be an art show or whether that be a game or a movie or something where you're actually using your photos as part of a bigger project. And so you've got um, you know, things like Digicam, which also has a, um, a photo processor as part of it called Show Photo that you can use separately. Um, you've got Raw Studio, you've got Photo X, you've got Fatch with a PH. Um, again, a wide range of, of impressive software for for handling the management of large collections of photos and pulling them off cameras. And um, of course, the real the trend now is doing HDR as well, um, high definition, um, or whatever it is, high, is it high dynamic range. Thank you. That's what I was looking for. Um, where you actually take a bunch of photos, um, some of which are underexposed and some of which are overexposed, and you merge them together so that you get a um, uh, either a um, non-realistic effect that looks cool or you attempt to approximate better the, the human eye's amazing capacity to, um, to deal with um, a bigger dynamic range than, than camera um, image sensors actually can. Um, and uh, you also get panorama software that can stitch images together and, and again, gives you more of a sense because, again, image sensors on cameras generally can't capture as much of the scene as you perceive with your eye. Um, so all of that has viable and useful open source tools available. Not to say that none of these tools um, don't need further work. There's always further work that needs doing in all these tools. But they're all already at a stage where we've had these for years and, and they're quite usable, even in professional environments. And then I mentioned vector images. Um, Inkscape and uh, Soddy Potty is a close relative, but Inkscape's the, the main branch. Um, has been around for a while. It's very good. Um, LibreOffice and OpenOffice Draw. Uh, an older one is Dia, D-I-A. Um, and there's an interesting one, a little s, capital K1, just to get really weird with the, with the capitalization, which is for prepress work and actually specialized for, for producing um, uh, really high quality, high resolution um, uh, images that go directly to, to uh, printing presses um, with direct PDF output. Um, there's even uh, things like SVG edit, which is written in JavaScript and which you can you know, run on a website. So again, we've got cloud-based image editors. There's a, uh, a few of those around now. Um, you know, Flickr has one and, and, and uh, and so we're starting to see, uh, you'll see this is a bit of a theme, that a lot of these things we're starting to see, um, cloud-based versions or web-hosted versions, um, which on the plus side, um, generally this is running on some sort of a LAMP stack. It's, it's, it's typically an, an open source stack that it's running on. On the minus side, um, not all of these cloud-based editing tools are actually open in and of themselves. Um, they may be developed with open source tools, but they may not necessarily be, be open for other people to, to modify, which is, which is not so great. Um, but... Um, 
the last thing I'll mention while I'm talking about images uh, is fonts. Uh, because, um, in fact, you can just use text with generic fonts, but it's often nicer to have fancy fonts that make your text look nice. And um, it's nice to be able to modify fonts or even design your own fonts. And again, we have open source tools for that. FontForge is the best known. Um, there's also one called BirdFont for Mac OS. It is an, it is an open source program. Um, uh, again, I'm going to point out that uh, there are open source programs on other platforms, not just on Linux. So that's, that's also viable if you're a content creator who um, is familiar with Windows or Mac, more, more likely Mac, but whatever your base platform is, there are still open source tools, and most of the tools I've talked about so far do in fact have versions that will run on other platforms, which is, again, useful because content creators don't always have time to, to learn new things and switch to another platform. So um, that kind of cross-platform support is good for getting people um, uh, ready to work as quickly as possible without having to learn a whole new infrastructure. And once they're familiar with and happy with the tools, then maybe they'll consider um, moving their whole environment to open source later on. So let's move on quickly now to um, audio. If you haven't noticed yet where these icons are coming from, these are the generic MIME type icons. Uh, I think they're the GNOME ones, which I thought was a, uh, which are also open. Um, so there you go, open icons. So in the audio world, the most obvious requirement um, is uh, capture and editing. Um, and um, uh, the, the simple programs are just recording programs with a little bit of editing, but there's also what's called digital audio workstations, which is fancier programs that actually keep track of settings and what, what you were last doing in your session. And you can have, you know, um, even, uh, you know, patch panel type arrangements for hooking together multiple tools and filters and things. And some of them have plug-in interfaces, and I could go on about that at great length, but um, there's a, a couple of really good websites that um, people who specialize in open source and Linux audio and have, have produced some websites that catalog all of this software and, and all the different plugins and things and, and, um, and even Linux Weekly News covers it from time to time. So um, I won't go into it in great detail, um, but some of the best known examples of that would be things like Audacity and Ardor, but also Joe Kosher, Sweep and Echo Sound. So again, plenty of good programs there. But as well as the editing side, there's also music composition and performance as well. Um, so um, we've got tools like Rose Garden, which is both a sequencer and a tool for writing musical scores. Uh, Lily Pond for typesetting your scores um, and then producing nice printed musical scores. Um, Hydrogen for doing drumming, a drum machine kind of program. Uh, Q Tractor, a sequencing program. Um, then you've got actual synthesis, things like the C Sound library, which is a huge library of things for um, writing programs that generate music. Um, synthesizers like uh, Spiral Synth for generating synthesized sounds, uh, Soft Synths that take samples, um, so things like Fluid Synth and uh, then things like uh, Zin Add Sub FX, which I won't even bother to go into the capitalization of that one, and um, uh, G Synth, um, so lots of different synthesizer programs um, which you can either play with your computer keyboard or with external MIDI devices, keyboards or other MIDI devices. Um, there's a whole little subcategory of organ synthesizers um, for pipe organs, Hammond organs, that kind of thing. Um, so programs like Aeolus, Beatrix, Bristol, Horgan D, and so on and so forth. And then sampler programs like Linux Sampler, and um, then front ends for that like QSampler. So again, audio very well represented, huge range of tools there for creating, composing, um, scoring, editing music. And then we move on to video. So video, you've got, um, I'm going to start with animation first. You've got 2D animation. Um, there aren't that many tools here. Uh, we've just been talking about how many awesome tools there are. Um, for 2D animation, um, really, you've got Synfig Studio, Pencil, and K2 are the most prominent ones. Yeah? Tux guitar. Yes, I, I actually um, uh, decided to skip over the, the guitar tools, but yes, you're right. There's also guitar tools, which is um, um, there's there's uh, um, synthetic guitar uh, programs, but also guitar tuning tools, and there's a whole range of other um, tools for people who are, who are into guitar. And I kind of skipped over that for time reasons, but yes, thanks for mentioning that. Um, so yeah, we've got 2D animation. We've got Symphix Studio, Pencil, and K2 are the most prominent ones. And in fact, um, Nina Paley, the um, the animator of um, the um, Sita sings the blues which she's just actually made Creative Commons Zero um, because she discovered for three years um, Cedar Sings the Blues, which is a beautiful animation, uh, has been available under a Creative Commons license and she found that some TV stations and movie studios wouldn't show it, even though they were like, oh, can we get the rights to this? And she was like, you already have the rights, you just have to agree to allow other people to copy it. And they're like, oh, that sounds too hard and we don't like that. And so she's given up and she's just said, right, 
it's public domain. Creative Commons Zero, public domain. Do whatever the hell you like. Don't bother me, just show it. <laughs> Um, so she's a pretty well-known personality and she's actually just blogged that she's not actually happy with the current open source 2D animation tools because they don't really go far enough for professional work. So she's looking for people who want to work with her in, um, in um, further extending any of those existing tools um, to suit her workflow. So I think there's more to be done there. But in the 3D world, uh, and admittedly you can use the 3D tools um, to create 2D animation, um, you just only look at it from one perspective. Um, uh, they're not really optimised for that, but people have done that. Uh, and in particular, there are like filters that you can use on some of the 3D animation programs to give you like a cartoony outline type look and things like that. And sometimes you don't really want 3D anyway. You want sort of 2.5D where it's, it's 3D but kind of mostly looks like 2D most of the time. Um, so 3D tools, we're, we're better served. Blender is the obvious one. Everyone's heard of Blender and Blender is awesome. Um, and then there's lesser known things like Art of Illusion, K3D, OpenFX, and a little tool called Make Human, which is specifically designed for creating characters um, and creating a model um, that you can use of, for, of an animated character. So that's kind of nifty. Um, I guess that would be the equivalent of the proprietary tool Poser. Um, and uh, in fact, uh, the next thing I'm going to talk about is video editing. And Blender actually has a video editor in it now called Blender VSE. So it's kind of an all-in-one. Um, but the, the real um, king of, of open source editing tools is Cinelera. Um, there was an earlier one called Broadcast 2000, but it evolved into Cinelera. Um, that really goes whole hog. It lets you do network-based um, rendering where you can hook multiple computers together to get your video renders out faster because video rendering is one thing that really will consume a lot of CPU. Modern CPUs are so fast now that most of the stuff we do, certainly the stuff I started out talking about, the text editing, and also for years now the audio editing and, and, and all of that stuff now will not strain your CPU, it, it just won't. I remember you know, decades ago you actually had um, specialist add-on cards like the Gravis Ultrasound that did all your audio processing because it was too much work for the CPU. That's not a problem now. Um, but for video rendering, when you're doing special effects and blending together multiple streams, that will still strain your CPU. Um, and so with Cinelera you can hook together your own little cluster at home and away you go and it's all built in, which is nice. But you've also got simpler tools like OpenShot and KDE and Live, Kino, PTV, um, lesser known things like Flowblade Movie Editor. Uh, and then fancy stuff like Lives, yes, it's capital L, little i, capital V, capital E, capital S, <coughs> which is not only video editing but also real-time VJ video editing. Um, so that if you're doing a club performance or something, you can be editing away in real time, which is kind of cool. It's capital L, little i, capital V, capital E, capital S. So lives, but with a little i. Um, and uh, Jashaka is another one. Um, so yeah, there's a range of nice uh, video editing tools. Um, and then there's transcoding, converting back and forth between different formats is quite important with video um, for two reasons. Firstly, because you will sometimes use source material that came in from somewhere in some weird format, and also because you may have to distribute it, as I said at the beginning of the talk, in some weird format that other people like, uh, or just to get it to play on your favorite device. Um, devices are getting better about this. I recently gave um, some files to my brother in um, uh, H.264 Matroshka format and his TV just understood it. So that was good because I wasn't sure if his TV would under understand Matroshka wrappers, but it did. So um, stuff is getting better partly because uh, the hardware is starting to actually be Linux based and have our open source libraries in it. Um, so that's really improved um, support, particularly a lot of the Asian vendors have been doing this for a while. You can get like funky Chinese DVD players that you can whack in a DVD ROM with stuff on it and it'll just go, oh, I can understand that format and it's awesome. Um, so um, transcoding tools, um, there's AVI DMUX, which also can be used for just simple editing and cutting stuff up as well. It's actually kind of a simple video editor too. Um, Handbrake, very well known. Handbrake has standardized presets that are just really useful because if you need to give someone something to run on their eye whatnot, their iPhone or iPad, or whatever, and Break just has presets for that that will actually work. Um, then there's Transcode, Transmageddon, um, and of course some command line tools like MNCoder and FFmpeg, which are basically just a collection of all the format libraries. Um, but there are front ends for that, things like Arista and WinFF. WinFF, despite the name, actually is available for both Windows and Linux, and that puts a GUI on top of FFmpeg so that you can transcode stuff without having to mess around too much on the command line. And the last thing I'll talk about on videos is subtitling. Um, because you might want people in multiple languages to handle your content. So we've got things like Subtitle Editor, Gnome Subtitles, K Subtitle, AG Sub, Joobla, and Galpo. And that brings me to the last slide, 
um, which wraps it all together. Um, now, libraries, I'm not talking about software libraries. I'm talking about libraries of existing art. So the Creative Commons is not just a um, set of uh, license agreements. They also have some really useful websites which list material that's available under those licenses. And so you can find out what is available as Creative Commons photos, what is available as Creative Commons videos, Creative Commons animations. Um, then there's also the Open Clip Art Library website, freesound.org. Um, Open Symphonia is a collection of samples of orchestral instruments. Um, and then, of course, there are big sites like the Internet Archive and, and so on. So there's a lot of places where you can actually get um, uh, pre-existing content to get you started, which is great, particularly for game creators. Um, for example, there was a um, game called Glitch that ran for three or four years that just recently closed, and last week they announced that they are going to open source all of the existing assets. So they had lots of little animated assets they created over those three or four years. That's all going to be available now if you want little dancing piggies or chickens or something. Just grab those assets, you're good. And distributions, and here's where it all comes together. Um, there are actually some, um, you know, a distribution in the Linux world is of course a um, collection of software, uh, often available on CD or DVD or USB or whatever. And there are a lot of nice people who put together entire distributions for artists. So you have things like 64 Studio, ArtistX, AV Linux, Dream Studio, Dynabolic, KX Studio, Music, Tango Studio, Ubuntu Studio, MDist, PureDyne, etc. There's a whole bunch of them, which are all collections, usually Linux based, of the tools I've just mentioned. They've selected out many of the best of, the, of all the tools I've mentioned during this talk, stuck them together in a package you can download, burn to a DVD or whatever, boot that up on any standard computer and away you go, you're ready to, to get creating with content and you don't have to pay any money to buy tools, the tools are all there and you can just start creating content. And so that I think is the real achievement of this community that we've actually been able to build all these things and we're still developing them and making them better and give artists a way to get started immediately without laying any money down and produce professional quality work um, straight away and all they need is some kind of computing device and some of the software that the community has made and that I think is something we should all be very proud of and what I've tried to summarise for you today.